All right, so for neurotransmitters, there's actually five structural classes. You could arrange these based off of the functions, but I'm gonna arrange them based off of their structure because their structure lends to what the function is. They're known as biogenic amines, amino acids, which hopefully if you've taken biochemistry, you know what that is, peptides, which are just long chains of amino acids, the purines, and then lastly, and it's very controversial, gases and lipid soluble type compounds. All of these neurotransmitters are going to act either directly or they're going to act via a second messenger. Um, and really, one of the most important things that you understand is that whether or not a neurotransmitter is going to have an excitatory effect or an inhibitory effect depends on the receptor. Okay, one of them that I'm going to mention as an example would be acetylcholine. Acetylcholine at the heart is an inhibitory effect. Okay, it, it slows the heart muscle contraction rate down. And then at the skeletal muscle, it has a excitatory muscle con uh, effect, an excitatory effect. So whenever I contract my muscles, especially my skeletal muscles, that's due to acetylcholine. And we'll talk more about that later. So the first one that I wanted to mention is acetylcholine. Um, it's made by acetyl-CoA plus a choline group. Here you can see a picture of it. Um, it has two functional, many functional roles actually, in the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, the neuromuscular junction. Because this kind of uh, is located in many other places, we've been able to really study the structure of it. We've been able to really study the kinetics of it. We know more about acetylcholine than we do about any other neurotransmitter. And there are two types of receptors, and these two types of receptors have different structural features and therefore play have different functional roles. There's nicotinic and um, muscarinic. I don't really know how to pronounce those terms correctly, so I apologize for that. Uh, the muscarinic receptors are very sensitive to muscarine. This is a compound that we isolated from a mushroom species that it's actually named after. It can be either excitatory or inhibitory depending on the receptor subtype. Do not forget that. All muscarinic receptors act via a second messenger system, specifically with a transmembrane alpha helix. Um, if you want to know what that is in detail, you can look at my biochemistry videos. All neuromuscular junctions in both branches of the autonomic nervous system. So both the sympathetic nervous system uses acetylcholine, and the parasympathetic nervous system uses acetylcholine, and the neuromuscular junction uses acetylcholine, okay? The other type of receptor is nicotinic. And these are sensitive to nicotine, in case you didn't know that, it's isolated from tobacco. And it has an excitatory effect at these receptors with a direct action, okay, found mostly in the central nervous system. So for example, if you've ever wondered why smokers get really, really, really cranky when they try to quit for the 10,000th time and fail, it's because nicotine binding is usually coupled with dopamine release um, in the central nervous system. One of the things that I found that was really interesting was that low levels of acetylcholine are correlated with Alzheimer's patients. Now, clearly, if acetylcholine can have either excitatory or inhibitory, depending on the receptor subtype, it makes sense for a neurodegenerative disease to have that correlation there. But the problem is that a statistical correlation does not imply a causative relationship. So uh, a lot of people who take uh, antihistamine type drugs are otherwise known as anticholinergenic. Um, certain types of drugs that treat uh, inflammatory bowel disease, certain types of second generation antihistamines for just generalized treating of allergies, they're gonna take a lot of anticholinergenic drugs. And this is kind of one of those things of which came first, the chicken or the egg. Because if you look at the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease, a lot of that is just oxidative stress, which inflammation is a huge contributor, a huge cause of oxidative stress. And especially at the level of what Alzheimer's is, is it's basically just the same as every other neurodegenerative disease in that it's a protein clumping problem. So um, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that some type of a inflammatory enzyme like a caspase was involved in Alzheimer's as well, or maybe some type of a heat shock protein was involved in Alzheimer's as well that plays a role in and all that stuff. So I, I guess the point that I'm making is that we just don't really know. Um, correlative does not mean causative. There's so many type of questions that a professor could ask about acetylcholine. It's really, the sky's the limit. Um, one of them that's really common, and it's really relevant in terms of clinical uh, understanding of, of not only acetylcholine, but the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, is organophosphate insecticides, or sarin gas. These guys are really structurally similar. And so what they do is they block acetylcholinesterase, which is a degradation enzyme activity. So like we had said, um, whenever you have a synapse here, 
between a dendrite and a, a synaptic button. It's either going to be diffusing away to be picked up by astrocytes, they're going to have reuptake, or on the surface of those neurons, there will be enzymes designed to break up the, uh, the neurotransmitter. In this context, acetylcholinesterase, esterase, it <laughs> breaks the ester linkage there, and so it's going to break down acetylcholine. And if you're t uh, poisoned by sarin gas, for example, or you're poisoned by, most likely poisoned by organophosphates, insecticides, your acetylcholinesterase is going to be blocked, and so you're going to have a lot more acetylcholine, I'll just draw it right here, a lot of acetylcholine at the dendrite, and um, you know, sarin gas is going to block it. Okay, so the reason why this is such a good uh, inhibitor of this activity is because it results in a strong covalent bond called the phosphodiester bond bound to that enzyme, so that enzyme can't do its job. Okay, and so what this results in is in, a, in just an ass load of acetylcholine happening at many, many parts of the body, um, at the neuromuscular junction, so we're going to have muscle spasms, and then also at the parasympathetic nervous system. So you're going to have an overstimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system, and that's what results in the acronym SLUGEM, salivation, lacrimation, uh, urogenital, gastrointestinal emesis, throwing up, and then mitotic pupils, your pupils will be constricted. Usually when people have this, they're going to die due to asphyxia, uh, the, the diaphragm is also uh, regulated by acetylcholine as well, so it's going to start spazzing out and you're not going to be able to control your breathing rate, eventually you'll die. The treatment for it is intravenous atropine and uh, we just give it to them until they're considered atropinized. So depending on how much of this they've had exposed to them, you'll just be giving them intravenous atropine the entire time. I've actually never had a patient that was a victim of organophosphate insecticides. Um, we've moved on to using more like gene therapies and things like that and vectors to, to genetically modify uh, organ, uh, plants to fight off uh, insects from eating them, but nevertheless, this is still used in certain parts of the world. Um, atropine blocks the acetylcholine at mu muscarinic receptors. I hope I'm pronouncing that, probably not. <laughs> Um, another thing that's really interesting to me is right here, acetylcholine is released. The release of it from the, the, the vesicle is inhibited by botulism toxin. And that's actually what they're giving to you when they give you a Botox injection. Yeah, the most toxic substance known to man. I think I read somewhere that one billionth of a gram can actually kill someone. So yeah, really, really, really toxic. And this is something that I saw from a website online. Um, it says that specific serotypes of the toxin cleave the synaptosomal associated proteins. I don't know why they always list the amount of the molecular weight of it. SNAP25, a protein from the soluble in ethyl uh, alamine sensitive factor. What I really want you to understand is the attachment receptor for snare family involved in vesicle fusion. That should look familiar to you and mediating the release of neurotransmitters, in particular acetylcholine from axon endings. So the vesicles that you, we have that release the neurotransmitter at this junction here, when you have botulism toxin, none of that is being released. So obviously, if that's the happening, your muscles can't contract, your muscles are paralyzed. That's why people who have Botox injection can't move their face. Another thing, and this is the last thing that I'm gonna mention, is called succicoline or curare. Curare is the, the primitive form of it. Succicoline, actually it's been a while since I've worked clinically. I don't know if this is still used. I hope they have some drugs that work better than it because it, frankly speaking, it kind of sucks sometimes. Um, but what you'll do is, in certain patients who have had uh, traumatic injuries or spinal damage or something like that, their jaw will lock shut. The muscles in their jaw will contract really strongly. And what you'll do is you'll give a patient succicoline and that blocks just temporarily blocks acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, paralyzes their jaw, paralyzes their diaphragm so that you can do an endotracheal intubation and you can actually breathe for those patients. Now, sometimes it doesn't work, but that's just my opinion on the succicoline. So maybe that'll help provide some uh, good test questions that your professors are going to ask, probably something along these lines, because acetylcholine is really well understood.